All right, so we're going to start recording on them. Uh, like I said, Flipgrid's due. Uh, all the rest of your work for this week is due. Please, let's make sure that we get all that turned in. Uh, Flipgrid's getting a little bit better. Make sure you're recording on the correct day. I've kind of been moving stuff around a little bit. Um, just make sure we're recording for the right day. Actually, if you just record, I'll be pretty happy. So, All right, night chapter four. So they're arriving at the camp uh, Buna. It looks almost deserted when they arrive. The head of the camp orders that food be brought to the 10 to 12-year-old prisoners. Uh, the German in charge of Eliezer's tent also takes special interest in the welfare of the children. Although his interest may not be so wholesome, uh, Eliezer later learns that many boys at the camp have been sexually abused. Um, this sexual predation of boys is another example of the inhumane treatment of the Jewish prisoners by those who had power over them. It goes to the theme uh, that we should be reading about of inhumanity. One of the assistants in charge of the tents tries to get Eliezer's shoes in exchange for good work unit assignment and keeping Eliezer and his father together, but he won't give up his shoes. His shoes are his literal only possession of value at this point, besides a little bit of dental work that he has done, so he's he really doesn't want to give those up. Uh, the prisoners spend three days in quarantine with medical and dental inspections. Then the capos arrive and select their work units. Um, the capos are the Jewish prisoners that are in charge of other prisoners. The laser's unit is joined by prisoners from a musician's unit, including Juliet, a, vi a violinist. They're sent to work in an electrical equipment warehouse. One of the musicians tells the laser that he has landed in a good unit, but that their capo, Edek, occasionally goes berserk and beats people. Um, when, they, when they arrive and they are in quarantine, the Nazis try to limit the spread of disease amongst their slave labor. If they're all sick, they can't work them to death for the Nazis, right? Um, so they want to get the most work out of the prisoners while providing them with the least amount of resources for survival. Musicians have, were ordered to play uh, marches as the prisoners left each day for work, again part of the inhumanity by which they're treated. In the warehouse he's working, there are also Polish and French women. Franek, the, for, the foreman, lets uh, Eliezer work next to his father. Eliezer befriends two Czech brothers, Yossi and Tibi, those uh, whose parents have been killed at Birkenau and who talk of going to Palestine after. Uh, Akiba Drumer discovers a passage in the Bible that he believes predict their liberation within a few weeks. Remember, Akiba is the, um, the rabbi. Uh, the Kabbalah, which Eliezer used to study, looks for hidden, deeper meanings within biblical text. A religious man like Akiba is relying on the same skills to which Eliezer once devoted his life in order to find some suggestion that God has a miracle in store. Um, this is part of the having and losing faith in God uh, theme that is going on throughout the book. Eliezer is ordered to go to the dentist to have his gold crown removed. Remember, that's that and his shoes are the only things that he has left. He fakes illness and the dentist tells him to come back later when he feels better. He gets sent a week later and is successful with the same excuse. The dentist is thrown into prison after that, and he's to be hanged because he's selling these crowns that he takes out from these prisoners on the black market, and that's not good. So because he's sent to um, be hanged, a laser basically gets to save his gold teeth. Uh, he desires uh, His desires and motivations, Eli's desires and motivations, have become simplified, right? Stay alive. Stay with my father, keep my shoes, keep my gold crown. His whole life is now those four things, five things, right? And that's breaking down the humanity of these uh, Jewish prisoners. At the warehouse, Eliezer works near a French girl. They don't speak to each other, and Eliezer pres presumes they don't really share a language. He suspects she might be Jewish, but uh, she's there as an Aryan deportee from occupied France. One day, Idek, the capo, beats Eliezer savagely. The girl comforts him, gives him some bread, and gives him words of encouragement in German. This is a rare example of comfort, comforting and sympathy among prisoners in uh, Eliezer's account. It may be that such sympathy and encouragement was given more frequently than he notes. Uh, he does give plenty examples, though, of the cruelty uh, that occurs among the mistreated people. 
Um, years later, after the war, uh, Eliezer sees a beautiful woman on the metro in Paris. They recognize each other from the warehouse and spend the evening reminiscing. She is, in fact, Jewish, but made it through the war with forged papers stating she was not. Uh, speaking German was a risk, she admits, but she had trusted Eliezer as, um, as a common uh, prisoner. The woman's survival is an example of how some Jews who were more aware of the dangers they faced were able to take measures, even risky ones, to avoid being marked for death at the concentration camps. Okay, this is about guilt and inaction. Like, she denied who she was to escape it. Uh, on other occasions, Eliezer can only watch as Idek beats his father with an iron bar. Um, Eliezer's instinct is to move farther away, and he feels anger in that moment toward his father for not avoiding this beating, not towards Idek, who's beating his father. The concentration camp perverts the father-son relationship. The fear of being killed on the spot, neither f uh, son nor father can stop the beatings. For Eli, the powerlessness feeds that misplaced resentment, right? He's not supposed to be upset at his father. His father's the one getting beaten. But it's perverted his perception so much. And it's further breaking down the humanity of all those prisoners. The foreman frantic demands the gold crown in the laser's mouth. And he refuses. But his father, he really isn't good at marching. Frannick starts to beat him every day for not marching in rhythm. Uh, Eliezer tries to give his father lessons. His father still can't march and still gets beaten until he relents, right? A dentist takes the crown out with a rusty spoon and he gives it to Frannick. The foreman is nice enough, nice in quotes, right, uh, to Eli until he sees his chance to use his position to take his small amount of wealth that he has left. Another example of people at their worst when given a little bit of power over a group of people who are treated like animals. One day, um, Idek, the capo, brings the entire unit to the warehouse even though there's no work that day. Eli wanders around and accidentally sees Idek having sex with a Polish girl. Later, Idek gives Eliezer 25 lashes with a whip in front of the rest of the prisoners as his father watches helplessly. Idek has the power to punish the Jews underneath him for whatever reason in any manner he feels like. All right. Once again, inhumanity theme coming through. During an air raid, the SS guards go into the bomb shelters. A prisoner tries to get some extra soup, but is killed by shrapnel from an exploding bomb. The prisoners are overjoyed at the bombing by American planes, even though it puts them in mortal danger. I mean, at this point, the destruction of their torturers seems more important to the prisoners than their own survival and liberation. A week later, the prisoners are assembled in front of the gallows that has been built in the center of the camp. One prisoner, a strong young man, is condemned to death for stealing. He curses Germany and shouts, Long live liberty, until the chair is pulled away and he dies. The prisoners think about their delayed supper, and Eliezer later enjoys his soup. Public hangings like this are meant to set an example for the rest of the prisoners. And it does make an impression on, on Eli. But his needs are so elemental at this point that the desire for food overcomes the disturbance of the hanging. Although he's forced to watch other hangings, uh, one in particular stays in his mind. The young assistant of a capo is arrested along with the capo and two prisoners after the power station in Buna blows up. The capo is tortured and sent to Auschwitz. Uh, the assistant, still only a boy, is tortured and then brought with the other two men to the gallows before the assembled camp. Prisoners refuse to help in this execution. Another example, I mean there's so many examples, of harsh treatment given to those who attempt revolt or sabotage to the Nazi war machine. Weeks of torture and then death. Okay, so there is something worse than living in this concentration camp. You could be tortured for weeks and then killed. Something about this particular boy, though, his youth and his innocence really captures and crushes the hearts of the rest of the prisoners. All of these activities meant to um, reinforce the inhumanity that is going on. Finally, in chapter 4, a man in the crowd behind Eli asks, where is God now? 
The three are hanged and the prisoners are forced to march past and look at them. The boy is still alive, dying slowly as Eli passes by, and he feels as his belief in God dies with that boy. Earlier, Eli ceased to be able to pray to God because he no longer believed that God was just. Now, he has seen so much evil that he no longer believes in God at all. Okay, so once again, the theme, having uh, and losing faith in God and then in humanity, the inhumane treatment. Uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a little bit shorter. Uh, it's the evening of Rosh Hashanah, and that's the Jewish New Year. And the Jews in Buna gather for a prayer. Eli, who once again lived for prayers and religious study, he rebels against this. He feels that humans are, in a sense, greater than God, stronger than God, to still pray to a God who allows such horrors. I was the accuser. God was the accused. I stood amid the praying congregation, observing it like a stranger. So by his reasoning, God is the weaker party since he rejects and punishes those in the Bible who are unjust or cruel, whereas the Jews, the Jews who are in Buna still honor a God who permits them to be gassed and burned by the millions. In other words, the people show more forgiveness to God than he does to them. Eli shares a silent, powerful moment of sadness and understanding with his father. For Yom Kippur, when the Jews traditionally fast, his father forbids him from fasting. Eli no longer believes in such rituals anyways. This is one of the few moments in the narrative of pure love and comprehension, but it occurs in an instant when both father and son share each other uh, their lost faith in God. Prisoners must go through a selection when they come back from work. The veterans say the newer prisoners are lucky not long before. Corpses are collected by the hundreds each day, and selections took place every week. The head of the block tells them to move around beforehand to give color to their skin and to show they are healthy. Dr. Mengele watches the prisoners go past him and occasionally writes down the tattooed number of one of them. A few of the feebler ones are written down, but Eli is not one. However, no one is immediately taken. Uh, Dr. Mengele is one of the head doctors there um, at the camp, and he's the one who kind of orchestrates what's going on. Um, his name is Yosef Mengele. Um, he castrated boys and men for no reason without anesthetic. He forced women to endure high-voltage electric shocks. He sterilized and horribly burned a group of Polish nuns using x-rays. Uh, he sewed two gypsy children together to try and create conjoined twins. He performed stomach surgeries on prisoners without anesthesia, and he routinely killed people in order to dissect him. Uh, Dr. Mengele is one of the horrors that uh, comes out of the Nazi death camps, where people can't even believe uh, that this was going on. They, they have no frame of reference for something this evil. And um, without his meticulous notes and the eyewitness accounts from other people, nobody would have believed exactly how sadistic and evil this person was. A few days later, the head of the block reads off the numbers of those who have been selected to die. Eli's father is among them, as is Akiba Drummer, the singer. His father hurriedly gives Eliezer uh, a knife and a spoon. It's basically all that he owns. Eli's sent off to work. All day he wonders if he'll ever see his father again. When he returns to camp with his work group that evening, his father is still there, having convinced the Nazis that he is still fit for work. This is another instance where Eliezer can do absolutely nothing to help protect his father. And of course, it, it just weighs upon him, feels even more guilt. During the period of selection, an old rabbi from Poland who used to pray constantly and recite pages of the Talmud loses his faith in God. Okay, another part of the theme. So does Akiba Drummer the religious singer who gives up and doesn't try to avoid selection. He asks the other prisoners to say a traditional prayer for him three days after his selection. They promise, but then they forget. This goes to show that Eli is not the only one whose faith is shattered by these concentration camps. This is what they were meant to do to people. They become indifferent to the life and death of others. It happens so frequently, it no longer affects them. Back in their normal lives, it would have been unthinkable not to say a prayer after the death of a friend. 
uh, now they just forget. When winter arrives, the prisoners truly start to know what it is to be cold. Christmas and New Year passed. In January, Eli's foot swells. He goes to see a doctor. He's a Jew and a fellow prisoner. The doctor tells him he needs an immediate operation or else amputation will soon be necessary. What happens if Eli's foot has to be taken off? He's dead. He can no longer work, and so it's basically a, a, a death sentence. Um, the doctor, he seems to have Eli's best interest at heart. Unlike the two dentists he's worked with, this doctor act, you know, actively seems like he cares. The surgery itself is successful, and two days later, Eli hears a rumor that the Red Army is only hours away from the camp, and that the camp is being evacuated, and all the invalids are being left behind, right? Uh, the Red Army is the Russian army, and so um, they have been steadily marching through Germany. This is towards the end of the war, and um, they think liberation is soon at hand, but not really. They're, they're taking all these prisoners away. Eli's neighbor in the hospital tells him that the invalids will be killed and sent to the crematorium, right? So we're leaving the people who can't run and who can't uh, get to the next camp, but they're not really leaving behind. They're just leaving behind bodies. Eli doesn't know what to believe, but he doesn't really want to be separated from his father. Like he's fought all this time so that they stay together. Him and his father talk. The doctor could enter his father into the hospital role as a patient, uh, and they could wait for the Russian but eventually they decide to leave with the evacuation. They're forced again to make what could be a life or death decision without having any reliable information to work on. The decision to not stay behind seems reasonable since the Nazis are continually killing and burning people who are no longer useful. So they have a, a high fear that they might just kill everybody who they leave behind. Uh, after the war, Eli learns that those who stayed at the hospital were liberated by the Red Army two days later. Once again, it seems as if God is playing a cruel trick on Eli, right? Uh, Eli spends a night back in his block. The prisoners are given bread and margarine for the trip ahead, right? They gotta, they gotta hoof it to the next camp. They gotta walk, actually run probably. The next morning, the prisoners wearing every layer of clothing they can find because it's freezing outside. They're about to leave when the head of the block orders them to clean their living space to show the liberating army that there were men living here, not pigs. The prisoners make an effort to assert their humanity here. The evening, surrounded by SS and guard dogs, with the snow falling heavily, the prisoners march out of the camp block by block. At last, Eli's block, block 57, marches out into the darkness. But the meaningless of this gesture is soon brought home by the terrors, the harshness, and the pointlessness of this next march. And so they start chapter 6, marching. Um, chapter 6, they are cursed and prodded by the SS and whipped by the wind. The prisoners march. The guards yell at them to go faster and they begin to run. They hear explosions from time to time. The SF, SS... I can't talk. The SS has orders to shoot anyone who can't keep the pace. So they're already in bad shape at this point, right? The conditions that they're in are just murderous and further degrading the humanity of everybody involved. Eli tries not to think. He tries to keep himself moving forward. Uh, a Polish youth who'd worked next to Eli in the warehouse has a stomach ache, and Eli encourages him, hey, keep going, keep going, you have to keep going. But he collapses and is basically trampled by everybody coming up behind him because everybody has to keep running. Eli just, he tries to become just body focused on his own survival. The Polish youth, he's not killed by the Nazis. He's killed by his fellow Jews who are so focused on their own running and their own survival that they just, they trample over him. Each step with uh, Eli's injured foot hurts him terribly and his father running beside him keeps him going. They can't slow down because the others from behind, they push him forward. Again, Eli's father helps him with encouragement right here. They keep going until the sky starts to lighten. An officer tells them they've gone 42 miles. That's insane. They pass through a deserted village and are finally allowed to rest in the snow. Eli follows his father into a half-collapsed shed. 
Uh, people are sleeping, and those who sleep too long, they begin to die. Uh, Eli's father won't let him sleep very long. They go outside, but they're just... All these people are dying everywhere, so they go back in the shed. This march and this run has made people so weak from not only the living conditions, but this death march, right, that they, they go to sleep and their body just gives out on them and they die. The well-loved rabbi called Rabbi Eli, Oho, Eli Ho'u comes to the shed. He's looking for his son. Uh, he's been separated from him for three years despite being to several camps. He says he was separated from his son on the road when the rabbi had fallen behind and his son didn't notice. Eli says he hasn't seen the rabbi's son. It's another father-son tandem. It, it mirrors Eli and his father, right? They're surviving for years in the camp, but the increasingly awful brutality eventually breaks those two up, something that Eli fears will happen to him and his father. Eli then remembers that, yeah, he saw the son deliberately abandon his father, the rabbi. The son sensed that his father was near the end and he distanced himself from him out of self-preservation. Even though he no longer believes in God, Eli prays that he doesn't do the same for his own father. The son abandonment of the rabbi's uh, his rabbi father is a reminder to Eli to fight whatever impulses he might have to view his weakening father as a burden, to remember his duty as a son, and to never abandon his father. The uh, SS soldiers get the prisoners moving again. They leave the dead behind where they lay in the snow. This is part of March. Uh, this next part is a lot less orderly. The soldiers themselves are tired, and they encourage the prisoners to keep going for a few more hours. Finally, they reach a new prison camp, Glowitz. The men are hustled into barracks where they collapse, treading on and crushing each other. They literally just go in there and fall down. Below him in the pile, uh, Eliezer hears the voice of Juliak, the violinist from Buna, crying for mercy. Juliak is worried that his violin will be crushed. Eliezer claws at people lying on top of him and suffocating him, and he manages to claw an opening for air. He calls to his father, who is nearby and still alive, and then he tries to sleep. Um, he conveys a sense of exhaustion so complete that people are literally collapsing on top of each other, either to sleep or to die. The margin between life and death is very narrow at this point, and the men, they don't have enough energy to care about one another's survival. They hear the sound of a violin, at night, someone is playing a part of a Beethoven concerto. Uh, Eliezer believes it's Juliak, who must have somehow managed to free himself from underneath the mass of exhausted and dying and dead people. Whenever Eli hears Beethoven later in life, he thinks of Juliak. Uh, Jewish musicians at Buna weren't allowed to play Beethoven, who was a German composer, um, just because they were Jews and, and they didn't have a right to play this German composer's music. Uh, but Juliak loves the music. Its power transcends the German inhumanity, as well as their attempts to claim it like exclusively as Ju uh, German heritage. The next morning, Eli sees Juliak near him, and he's dead, and his violin has been trampled. So the music was briefly uplit uh, uplifting for the prisoners, but in the end, the result's the same. Uh, the prisoners are kept at Gluitz without food or water for three days. They can hear gunfire and think the front might be close, but have no faith in being rescued. On the third day, the weak are divided from those who can still walk okay. Uh, Eli's father is selected for the weak. Eli runs after him. The SS grab him, and in the confusion, his father slips into the unselected group. Although some other people are shot when he does this. Uh, here, Eli takes a risk in trying to save his father. He creates a disturbance, and his father is able to get out of this group of condemned people. But it, Eli pays a price. He creates the disturbance, and other people are shot instead of his father. This group is marched out of the camp to a railway. They're herded onto a long train of cattle cars, 100 prisoners to a car. It's snowing heavily, and these uh, cattle cars, they have no roof. 
the train moves out. Uh, on the way to Auschwitz, there were 80 people crammed into a car. Now there are 100. A reflection of how emaciated they are. Shut it! Sorry, my dog was going crazy. All right, so basically they could fit more people in because there's less of the people to fit. They're really emaciated, and uh, it just shows the Nazis' kind of brutal treatment of this group of people throughout the whole uh, passage. Uh, the, this is the meat of the book. We were introduced to the horrors of the concentration camps, and just when we thought it couldn't get more, it does. And this is where Eli has his faith shaken and broken. And he can no longer uh, say his prayers. He's basically just lost, lost faith in God at all. Um, brutal part of the book. It seems that, that liberation, that freedom is so close, yet they can't really hope for it because of the brutal conditions that they continue to find themselves in. And just when they think it's going to get a little bit better, it doesn't. It gets insanely worse with this crazy march across miles and miles in snow. So, uh, it does go from bad to worse. I think that's all I got for today, guys. Um, let's go ahead and end there. Uh, make sure you get all those, the two short stories, the two vocab, I'm sorry, the two short stories, the two poems. Your vocab test should come out in a second. It's vocab for chapter two. And then your night quiz for chapters four through six should also be coming out um, in the next couple minutes. Uh, let me get a an attendance check before I let you go. We are good. Uh, your look at that. I think your quiz just came out. Yep, night four through six. I'll be dropping the vocab link in there for the test. Make sure you go ahead and take that, uh, and make sure you check your um, your assignments for last week. I got those um, graded. Uh, if that's it, have a good day. I'll be on for questions. If not, let's get those uh, those quizzes and uh, done and all your work turned in. Have a good weekend.